Since premiering in 2009, Pawn Stars has featured an endless array of movie props. Owner Rick, his son Big Hoss, and friend Chumley have checked out everything from lightsabers to pop-up books to famous cars. Here are some of the most epic movie props ever seen on Pawn Stars. While Pawn Stars has featured plenty of Star Wars memorabilia over the years, a collection from Season 17 takes the cake. It includes Luke Skywalker's lightsaber from Return of the Jedi, an original poster signed by the main cast, and the original handwritten script signed by filmmaker George Lucas himself. In an unusual move, Rick travels all the way to London to the studio where much of the iconic original trilogy was filmed to meet with a guy who preserves Star Wars memorabilia. Despite the seller bringing out the lightsaber and script to show off, they aren't actually actually for sale. But luckily for Rick, the poster is. The possibly one-of-a-kind item, signed by the trifecta of Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, and Harrison Ford, plus others, is estimated to be worth a whopping $50,000. Given that the Pawn Stars Patrol always haggles for the best possible price, Rick halves that and makes a first offer of $25,000. After some very polite back and forth, they agree on $34,000. So while Rick somehow walked through the doors a lukewarm Star Wars fan, he leaves feeling like the force will be with him when he resells the poster. If money is all that you love, then that's what you'll receive. In season 14, a seller comes into the Pawn Stars shop with what he says is the only caped costume worn by Christopher Reeve in the original 1978 Superman movie and a kryptonite crystal. However, both these items lead to a bit of squabbling. First of all, Rick and Big Hoss debate whether or not Reeve should be considered the original Superman since a TV show predated him. Next, they discuss whether this could actually be the only bodysuit made for the movie. The seller sticks to his guns that it's a one of a kind, but Rick isn't so sure. In a very Rick moment, he wonders what if Reeve ate a hot dog during a lunch break, dribbled some mustard on himself, and had to make a quick costume change. This is all small potatoes compared to the very serious issue Big Hoss flags. The green crystal is not a piece of kryptonite. It's actually the crystal that created Superman's Fortress of Solitude. In any case, the guys decide they need an expert opinion and call in Hollywood memorabilia specialist Tall Rob, who confirms that films never made just one of anything. There's always a backup. After finding an authentic prop number in Inside the suit with the name C. Reeve inscribed, Tal Rob concludes that it's legit and that it would sell for at least $250,000 at auction. Problem is, the seller wants $300,000. So when Rick only offers him $200,000, the owner has an understandable response. Bye. When Rick arrives in Los Angeles to check out a stash of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory props, you'd think he won a golden ticket. The collection features some of the most memorable artifacts from the classic 1971 film, including Willy Wonka's signature hat, a golden ticket, several Wonka bars, and the centerpiece of the collection, an everlasting gobstopper. When the seller wheels out the rare items, Rick is downright giddy. He even goes so far as to take a selfie while sporting the hat Gene Wilder wore in the movie. He then lets out a deep sigh while looking longingly at an original golden ticket it, which was actually used on screen. When the everlasting gobstopper is revealed, it's housed in a glass case, causing Rick to liken it to seeing the Hope Diamond. Of course, he reacted the way most of us would. I want an everlasting gobstopper! Me too! And me! Bought at auction by the seller, the items were originally owned by Julie Don Cole, the actress who played the petulant Veruca Salt. For the entire collection, the seller is asking $725,000, which is too steep for the Pawn Stars patriarch, but he really wants that gobstopper. The seller is willing to let it go for $100,000. Rick agrees to the price if a wooden Wonka bar is thrown in. In the end, they settle on $105,000 for the two pieces, and Rick walks away looking like a kid who just won a chocolate factory. While in Orlando, Rick gets a lead on someone selling the 1976 AMC Pacer seen in Wayne's World's iconic Bohemian Rhapsody scene. Ah, the Mirthmobile. The pint-sized powder blue car with flames licking the sides was featured prominently in the 1992 flick, which stars Mike Myers and Dana Carvey as two headbangers who broadcast a public access show from a basement. Rick is psyched to find that the car still has the licorice dispenser seen in the movie and a couple of camera mounts for shooting the interior scenes, but he's not so thrilled by the overall condition. The car doesn't even run and needs a lot of work. The seller is asking $15,000, but Rick thinks he'll have to invest that much money just to fix it up, so he offers $9,000. The seller asks for $10,000, they meet in the middle at $9,500, which was a steal considering Pawn Stars had the car completely restored and resold it the following year at auction for $37,400. Excellent. 
A cocky seller who unsuccessfully tried to sell Rick a DeLorean in the past struts into the Pawn Stars shop during season 15 with a screen-used cover of the sports almanac featured in Back to the Future Part 2. Christopher Lloyd, who plays mad scientist Doc Brown, and Thomas F. Wilson, who plays bully Biff, have signed it. But Big Hoss is quick to point out that the film's star, Michael J. Fox, did not. The whole basis of the 1989 movie revolves around the sports almanac, which collects sports statistics from 1950 to 2000 and is used by Biff to alter the past in his favor. It's one of 24 prop almanacs made for the movie because every time an actor held one in a scene, it would get wrinkled. The cover is authenticated by the Back to the Future prop master. However, he says the autographs actually decrease the value, which is somewhere around $2,500. This makes the seller raise a suspicious eyebrow because he thinks it's worth $7,500. So when Rick offers $1,500 for the piece, the seller gives him some lip, telling him not to make the same mistake he made with the DeLorean offer. To this, this, Big Hoss shakes his hand and says no to the deal. No? Yeah, what are you, deaf and stupid? I said no! Possessed doll Chucky from 1988's Child's Play has probably haunted many people's dreams, so when a seller comes into the Pawn Stars shop bearing the doll Chucky was created from, Big Hoss has childhood flashbacks of being absolutely terrified. Thankfully, it's the pre-possessed version of the doll called a good guy, and it's still in the original box. Chumley notes that all the dolls were blown up in the movie, so he questions the prop's authenticity. Enter expert Tall Rob to weigh in on the situation. After looking the box over and explaining that numerous additional dolls were made for the film, he's convinced it's the real deal. However, since it was just a background prop, it's not worth as much as, say, the knife Chucky wields on screen. The prop doll is estimated to be worth $5,000 at auction. That's bad news for the seller, who was hoping for eight grand. And the news gets even worse as Big Hoss only offers to pay $2,000. No deal is struck and the seller walks, letting Hoss breathe a sigh of relief that he won't have to see Chucky again. I'll be back. I always come back. In season 6 of Pawn Stars, a seller brings in a bat-shaped weapon called a Batarang and a pop-up book riddle that Jim Carrey used as the Riddler in the 1995 Val Kilmer-led Batman Forever. While the movie was a box office success, it was widely panned by both critics and fans alike. Big Hoss immediately passes on the Batarang because the seller wants $1,000 for it, but he's intrigued by the cool-looking, one-of-a-kind pop-up riddle because it will appeal to both movie and comic book fans. Throughout the movie, the Riddler leaves different pop-up clues for Batman to solve, and this was one that actually changed hands between the actors. The seller wants $5,000 just for the book, but Big Hoss has other plans. Let's get real. He's willing to shell out $2,200 and not a penny more. Haas doesn't want to spend a lot of money on a prop from a film that he says people didn't even like. The seller ends up declining Haas's offer and closes the book on his Pawn Stars experience. When Chumley gets a lead on some props from Terminator 3 – Rise of the Machines, he drags Rick to Los Angeles with him to take a look at his discovery. Rick is a little nervous about what he's gotten himself into because you never know with Chum, but he's pleasantly surprised when he's shown three partial robotic torsos that appeared in the 2003 Arnold Schwarzenegger film. The props were seen in the background of fictional company CRS's manufacturing facility where an army of robots is being built. Although Rick calls them dated, he's still intrigued. While the torsos weren't featured props, he believes that even casual Terminator fans will recognize them and shell out some cash. When the seller asks for $5,500 apiece, Rick calls in an expert, the actual prop master from the movie. She estimates them to be worth about $4,000 each. After some audible sighing and light haggling, Rick buys one for $3,100, and he even seems happy with Chumley. My database does not encompass the dynamics of human peer bonding. Anyone who's seen Austin Powers' International Man of Mystery remembers his cryogenic chamber, in which he was frozen before reigniting his feud with his nemesis, Dr. Evil. So when fanboy Chumley hears it's for sale, he heads to L.A. to see the life-size prop in person. Of course, once he's there, Chumley can't help but get inside the chamber and imitate Austin Powers' star, Mike Myers. Somehow the seller has never seen the film, but that doesn't stop him from requesting a hefty sum for the prop. One million dollars. Well, actually, he only asks $8,500 for the piece, but that still seems steep to Chumley, so he calls in an expert, Tal Rob. Upon inspecting the artifact, Chumley and Tal Rob notice a lot of wear and tear. The Austin Powers nameplate is missing from the top of the chamber, and the glass, which is actually flimsy plastic, is cracked, cloudy, and missing chunks. The sheer size and condition will limit potential buyers, so it's valued at $3,500. When Chumley and the seller can't agree on the price, he has to walk away without the groovy prop. Luckily, his mojo is still intact. 
Yeah, baby! Rick and Chumley go to a Star Wars superfan's house to check out his collection of original movie memorabilia. Inside, they find an impressive lot that includes C-3PO's prototype eyes, a Stormtrooper blaster gun, and a Sarlacc Pit tentacle puppet used in Return of the Jedi. Rick is definitely intrigued by the prospect of buying some of the items because, as he puts it, Star Wars fans are the craziest, nuttiest group of people who'll pay anything for props from their favorite movies. Proving his point, the seller admits that he's seen the original 1977 film at least 1,000 times. That's impossible, even for a computer. When the seller says he wants $80,000 for the whole package, Rick calls in an expert, who says there's a lot of Star Wars knockoffs out in the world. But these are, in fact, the real deal, adding that the entire lot is probably worth $75,000. Based on that info, Rick initially offers $50,000, then bumps it up to $52,000. Ultimately, the seller declines, saying that when it comes to price, they're a galaxy far, far away from each other. <laughs> <laughs> Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.